Hey, so my name is Marcel Oldman. I work for Intel, and this is the presentation about a project we've been working on for about a year now, which is a new wireless daemon uh, for Linux. Um, so I gave this talk, or a, a version of this talk, uh, two weeks ago at the SystemD conference. Um, I forgot to mention a couple of people that have been working on this one in the background. So it's a bunch of people from Intel that have been heavily um, working on this, also Dennis Kenzi is our lead who works on it, Andrew has doing a lot of code contributions, Tim and Ray will uh, work on it, and Matt worked also on a lot of extra new kernel interfaces that we needed or changes to kernel interfaces. So uh, I will walk you through this one during the talk, it's just these guys have been working in the background, so it's just not me, and they've been doing uh, a lot of work to make this project a reality. Um, myself, I've been maintaining Bluesy since 2004, so that's pretty much a long ride by now. Uh, the project is 16, over 16 years old. I've been maintaining it for over 12 years now, and it has been a heck of a ride. Um, I joined Intel OTC, the Open Source Technology Center, in 2007. And since I've created Conman, Ophono, Packron, and a couple of other projects that I will go through uh, today a little bit and mention them. Um, but when I joined back in the days, we fundamentally had a vision to build something different so you actually Linux becomes a more modern uh, connectivity stack uh, and use it for something else. And the vision looked a little bit like this. We wanted uh, proper drivers inside the Linux kernel to abstract everything we needed. We wanted subsystems for everything technology that we have, NFC, Bluetooth Classic, Low Energy, Mesh. Um, Low Energy didn't exist when I started at OTC. Mesh is ex uh, coming to existing next year. 15.4 existed, but wasn't really used at all except for some specialized projects. Wi-Fi was around, 3G and 2G was around, LTE came later. So I updated the slide a little bit and said, okay, we wanted the subsystem broken out, the drivers generic, and then we want to have a connection manager, which we used uh, con uh, wrote Conman for, bundling these together, and then we have our applications being able to drive them. So that was the vision about uh, nine years ago, uh, and we made a bunch of success in driving to that vision. Um, but it actually looked, when we looked at this one, uh, it looked not really complete. So NFC subsystem, we put in existence, we put a user space daemon in there that can drive it so you can use NFC on Linux pretty easily with card emulation and everything else. Nice and good. Bluesy has been around longer. We did a lot of refactoring to make this work with Bluetooth Low Energy, unify things, make this simpler, test cases, and so on and so forth. Pretty happy with this one as well. Mesh is coming. Mesh is coming also for Linux, so we're really happy with that one. Uh, 15.4. We spent a lot of time actually making 15.4 a reality subsystem with breakout of 6 Lopan and something else. Um, it is well, but you see there's something missing. We don't really have user space driving it. Um, 802.11 existed, was driven towards from moving away from wireless extensions into config 802.11. Um, we had the W supplicant on top of it, which we think would fall into the same category as Lucy and Nerd, and actually doing the separation, but it actually doesn't. So it needs a lot of extra code to be able to work as what it's supposed to be doing, and I will get into the details on why is that. So what we see there, while you would expect in WSuplicant to fulfill the job of doing the heavy lifting, actually Conman on WSuplicant is the only one together that actually do the heavy lifting. Everybody copies these codes around, be it Network Manager being some homegrown tool in an embedded system, somewhere in the middle of the ocean or something else. Um, the uh, cellular side looks similar enough. It's not completely identical mainly because cellular isn't really easy to fit in a subsystem since it's a bunch of uh, uh, standards that run on various parts of your hardware. But we got it to the level that we have hardware subsystems for the different uh, uh, manufacturers like um, back in the days Nokia, uh, Qualcomm, uh, STRX, and so on and so forth. And then these drivers made this unified and then Ophono could just use these drivers. So they have, Ophono has a little bit of hardware abstraction in there, but that's about it. But it made it nice and clean. So the right side looks good, the left side looks good, in the middle, um, it's a little bit uh, tricky. So what we hope, what we get to, is that we actually can fix the 8211 side, and after that one we're going to tackle the uh, 15.4 side. So this talk will be about us doing IWD, which is the Internet Wireless Daemon, or INET Wireless Daemon, um, that will replace WSuplicant and uh, will be allowing us to actually fit into the vision where we have a tool that actually does exactly what we need to do, and it can hook up easily in Conman Network Manager or whatever flavor of connectivity management you're actually going to use. The Node Manager put in white here, it's something you will start working next, but 15.4 needs something similar as well, where your nodes are well be managed and you expose a unified view one layer up. So the really important question is why actually do this again? So there's a 
few problems with WS Supplicant that we cannot fix and upstream also don't want to get fixed. First of all, WS Supplicant is non-persistent. So whatever you're going to do in it, it will not remember it. If you looked at the previous diagrams of BlueZ, Nerd, or Phono, whenever you configured a network or whenever you uh, uh, paired a device or whatever you did, it got remembered. You can reboot, you can restart. This information is lost. It's fully stateful in that regard, so I know what I've done. W supplicant, you restart it, all the information are gone. That means some other entity has to store it, which means for all, for 90% of your services, you store this on a level down. For W supplicant, you have to store this and level up. And they always say, yes, there's some functionality to over redo the uh, configuration networks, but it's so hackish and problematic that nobody actually uses it. So everybody stores it at a higher, higher layer, which makes it complicated since you have an imbalance in how uh, your layers are uh, structured in your system. Um, as I said, Ophono Bluesy, you connect to one network, you put an APN, you put a pair device, it's always persistent, we'll remember it. So Conman doesn't have to do anything. Um, the other problem is that actually W supplicant does a lot of work, but it doesn't go all the way. You would something, oh, it extract me from all the details, the only thing I really have to do is find my network and connect to it. Yeah, not really. You have to know a lot of details on how Wi-Fi is done. You have to do a lot of parsing of information elements that come from the network to decide what you do because it's really not giving you any information. It's like, look, read your Wi-Fi specs all by yourself and then figure this one out what you have to do. Which is, look, I just wanted to connect to it. I don't want to read a 2,000-page document to figure out that this information element means that I have to use that, that passphrase or that I'm using a push-button method to actually gain my credentials. Um, these things should be really hidden. And any attempt to actually make W supplicant is something that actually does any of these things, be persistent or uh, has more information exposed, got always really blocked because essentially, it, in a lot of cases, it just hands down what the hardware gives you. So what you get over the interface goes out from the kernel, goes into supplicant, and then it goes to you when you have to do the connection manager, which goes like, um, what have all the previous I've been doing with this information? The answer is nothing. On the other hand, W supplicant abstracts literally everything underneath the hardware for I don't know how many different operating systems, be it in RTOS, be it Windows, be it Mac OS, be it I don't know what, be it wireless extensions that we all try to uh, uh, forget and that never existed and have some other support for things that I don't know why uh, and still in there. And these abstractions trying to unify everything across, which makes a lot of complications when you can't unify things because different hardware, or different operating systems work differently. And then it becomes really tricky and these abstractions actually get in your way while being a really great system on Linux, where it's used uh, a lot, uh, it has a lot of drawbacks in cases where you actually can't use it. Um, the, my biggest pain point is with some of these operations it's doing on the hardware, because they're not really nicely abstracted. They're doing it in a blocking fashion. It goes really, uh, have you done this yet, uh, piece of hardware? Have you done that? And then it makes a decision. It's like, uh, these two pieces might be completely independent, have to, uh, done things differently, and we can't really have uh, system just waiting around and doing uh, something else while just waiting for something to happen. Um, especially if the interface it's using in Linux is fully asynchronous where we actually made sure that the hardware reports events as they happen so you can actually pick them up and make decisions based on it. So um, there's a couple of other issues uh, with this one where um, um, it becomes really complicated to work with. Some things we fixed in the past, other things we couldn't fix because upstream didn't want to take this. So at some point if the upstream doesn't want to have your changes, then you actually have to do something else. And there's always been forks of forks of W supplicant, and we didn't want to, okay, if you want to fork it, then we can also start our own project. So W supplicant looks a little bit like this. Um, and I don't want to, if you carry this around, I certainly don't. So the goal was, let's see what we actually need if you want to build this for Linux. Um, and just for reference, I'm going to take this diagram to a couple of slides and iterations on what we have done. Um, w supplicant, um, from a simple viewpoint. It's way more complex than this, but it has a lot of complicated things. On the Linux side is you have a soft Mac hardware, you have full Mac hardware. The soft Mac needs a Mac A211 framework. Uh, Config A211 binds these together. Uh, and then you have interfaces for Netlink and for wireless extensions. Yes, we're still carrying wireless extensions, backwards compatibility code around. That looks rather sane, uh, but then it goes to user space. It can use either lib nl2 libnl3, and if this will be ever in libnl4, then it will be also have an option to use this one, and they have different compile switches for doing I don't know what. It can also alternatively still switch back to wireless extensions if you find some really old hardware, or because you like that interface more, or have some really nasty hacks in there. And then exposes this to user space in at least four different ways that I know. If it's a control interface with a unit socket, which is pretty much um, a bash-like interface where you type these things, 
and you might get different strings back on what's happening. It's great for doing this programmatically. It's great for a user to do something, but programmatically from a daemon, um, horrible. Then the dbus1 interface was uh, absolutely useless. Um, we tried to make this work. We fixed it with a dbus2 interface. But fundamentally, we have to actually get to a third generation where we get things done and where it doesn't swallow states or does something really funky. And I also find lately that they actually have some binder interface where it probably goes directly over binder. And there might be three or four more that I haven't even discovered because the code base is huge. So when we built Conman, what we had to do actually to actually uh, get the Dbus version 2 interface working, we actually had to put a supplicant abstraction layer on top of this that actually handled all the things that interface didn't give us. Uh, we called it G supplicant because it was glib integrated with the glib or gdbus bindings. Um, but it was pretty much we had to put a lot of extra work in there to actually make this fly. And then Conman could finally start using it and still had to do a lot of extra work in their plugins. Well, if you compare the size of the plugin when Conman wants to talk to Bluetooth, it's like um, 10 or 20% of what the Wi-Fi plugin has to do, which gives like something is really, really wrong here. So the vision was, let's do this simpler. We need to keep the difference between uh, full max and soft max. So these are on the right side. So we have MacH11, Config 11 and Netlink. We don't want to do wireless extensions. They're broken. We can't fix them. Just ignore them. Hopefully, if at some point, they get removed from the kernel. Then we want to put a wireless team in there that exposes the Dbus interface. And then we're going to have Conman talking to it. So this is what we thought, OK, this is what we have to do. Um, and that's pretty much where we went, OK, Config 11 Netlink into 11 that's what we want. And should be the only API in going to this one. No extra interfaces for something else that should work. We want proper hot plug support, so whatever actually happens, we can actually detect that new hardware comes and goes. Yes, some hardware is built in, but a lot of uh, thing, times you have USB dongles where it actually would work. Dummy supplicant doesn't actually make this work. They hack around this really heavily and hope for the best that they detect hot plug events. And every time I look at this one, uh, uh, it makes me really sick. There were a few Netlink A211 features that were documented in a way they're supposed to work. They didn't work this way. We only figured this out while toying with this one. So at the end of the day, um, I think these ones are all fixed now and pushed upstream, so the kernel should be fine. Um, looking into this one, we realized, OK, we can't use libnetlink or libnl because it's a blocking design. It can't track family changes. So when you actually would do any kind of changes inside the kernel and the family IDs would be changing, you would be out of a sudden talking to a different service and nobody knows why. So if you have wsupplicant running and you accidentally try to unload the uh, uh, Wi-Fi driver or the Wi-Fi uh, Max uh, layers and reload them, uh, wsupplicant would basically fall over and had no idea what was happening. Uh, they might have fixed this by now by just brute uh, rediscovering everything. Um, but generic dating works similar in a way that Dbus works, where actually services get announced and you can discover them and you can dis discover changes. So we needed something that can do this as well. Um, with that one realizing, we actually had to go one step back from our IWD uh, vision and say, look, we need something else to actually do first. So introducing that, we did a couple of years back ELL, which stands for Embedded Linux Library, um, which is pretty much glib, but for smaller and IoT devices. So we put in main loops, signal handling timeouts, asynchronous I.O., done right. Uh, we put in uh, strings and hash tables and queues and ring buffers. And also, we took the systemd hardware database and integrated as well. You will see this later, why we've done this. It was almost like, yes, we can. It's easy code to do. Um, at this point, this is nothing really earth shattering. It's nothing special. That's what you would have to do anyway, you are, or you picked some other library that would have done this. But since we had the asynchronous I.O., we said, OK, let's put Netlink on top of this one. And we actually put the basic Netlink support and put this in there as well. And we included RTNL support in there. So this works really, really nicely um, with actually having to deal with RTNL and Netlink. Um, that said, generic Netlink sits on top of Netlink. So we put generic Netlink here as well and had finally a library that was doing this fully asynchronously and was having uh, discovery and tracking of families correctly. So we could send Netlink messages and receive events and broadcast and multicast really nicely in a really simple way and a nice API. Um, that project is already open source. So have a look at this one. Um, then we took it one step further and said, why don't we put Dbus support then as well? Because libdbus has always been bugging me for a lot of things. Uh, and system leads start to doing their own uh, Dbus libraries and said, look, um, if we put this in there, then A, what are we gonna, ever going to do with KDbus has a second implementation and we can nicely test this. And we also have a fully integrated Dbus support in our daemon and we will need this for a couple other projects. So we had KDbus support in there. KDbus is dead. Um, we're going to remove this soon, but we had it there as well working. Those first versions of IWD were actually running on KDbus exclusively. 
Uh, later on, we put dbus support in there, so it's full dbus support. So you have you don't need libdbus, you just need uh, libl, and you have uh, generic netting and dbus support. Um, the logging, we decided to just go straight to the journal. Um, um, that can be fixed if you want to do something else, but it can talk directly to the journal without needing anything else in between, and we optimized this so it doesn't have too many memory copies there. Sources are on L, uh, uh, in uh, l slash l.git on kernel.org, you will easily find it. It has been there for a while now. Uh, some other projects have been using it. We're still on our path to making this stable, but I think we're really close in actually putting out the stable version with the stable API on this one. And I will get to back what else we added to L in some later slides. So with that one, I had to update the diagrams a little bit. The left side stayed the same, but essentially we said, okay, look, we're not gonna stuffing everything in IWD. Um, we're taking L so we can reuse it in other projects and putting the basic building blocks for uh, Netlink and Dbus in there so we can use this. So it's just, we push in L in there, so we have L and IWD, and then everything looks the same. Looks still pretty straightforward as from the stack diagram and what we really wanted. So with this one in mind, we could start it actually programming the kernel interface, bring up the interfaces, uh, start scanning, start uh, collecting uh, networks around you, start grouping networks. We could active passive scanning, nicely control this how we wanted it, um, do the SSI do grouping as needed, um, and we just supported open networks. It's pretty much straightforward at that point. You just tell the kernel to connect to it and you are done. Easy going, great, was a really quick step to get to the sun uh, after having L in place and generic deadlink support. So then I said, look, now we actually have to take this teeny tiny proof of concept and make this a little bit more useful. So let's get to actually making WPA2 work. So we ignored uh, uh, web, uh, and I don't have web support at the moment. We said just ignore this. I see if someone actually really screams and using this one, I use uh, security and encryption that is completely broken and see if someone actually notices. Anyway, we start with WP2, so four-way handshake done via an ethernet port, and I was gonna look, I uh, know we have to open an ethernet port and do a packet, raw packet handling. Um, feels absolutely funny. Uh, and still beats me today why it is done this way, because at the end of the day, it needs to be fully synchronized with what we have exposed at the states at config to 11 because whatever you do on the uh, Ethernet port needs to feed back in uh, the handshake completed, the handshake didn't complete, and so on and so forth to signal the networking stack what actually happens and what has been done. And this is a great pain of source if you're fully asynch asynchronous because you don't know when the kernel schedules what. So if you receive a packet on the Ethernet port, you might haven't received the event with a notification about what information elements have been used or what's your encryption and so on and so forth. So. W Supplicant works around this quite a lot. Um, we have to work around this as well. So I think what has to happen that at least all these Ethernet ports get forwarded through the config to 11 interface so we have ordered uh, arrival of the events. Right now it's a big mess and I think it's a huge design flaw in the wireless stack that this has been, been separate. W Supplicant has a little bit easier because it does a blocking uh, operation for a lot of things, it does polling. So um, it isn't done with the one operation before it receives the other one. With our fully asynchronous design, we might receive the events at, uh, at the same time in different orders and depending on what the kernel scalier decided to give priority to. Um, encryption keys are again re reprogrammed into the kernel, so they have to go back to Netlink into 11, then you tell you have the keys and so on and so forth, and you refresh goes back to user space again. We say, okay, uh, you can refresh, um, we can offload this as well, and so on and so forth, and it requires a little bit of station management code where you say, okay, I have to manage actually a station now more closely because if anything changes in the uh, uh, EAP uh, configuration, then you actually have to redo the keying and so on and so forth. All not too much, but it went like, look, we have to do a lot of crypto, we have to do a lot of handling, what we need, want to do next. So this went us back to, um, we need some cryptographic support libraries. Um, what most people do is they, oh, if you need uh, cryptographic support, we're just gonna take OpenSSL. Um, every time I have to do this, uh, I feel uh, physically sick. I don't really want to do it because A, the library is huge, and B, it's not an easy interface. And in a lot of cases, you need 10% of what OpenSSL or Libcrypt or something else offers. So we actually went a different route and said, okay, um, for the random numbers that we need, um, we could use DevU random, but fundamentally Linux gained a system call for get random that is done the right way how you want most of these things and solves the problem with the boot up time you don't have to worry about, so we're actually trying to use for all random stuff the get random system call. And for all the ciphers and hashes, um, we actually just use AFALC. AFALC is a crypto interface for symmetric ciphers into the kernel. It supports hashes, 
symmetric ciphers and a couple of other uh, neat features um, that we can use and have been extended over the last couple of uh, kernel releases. So we actually have everything from ACCB, CCM, uh, all the vision, uh, CMAX, uh, HMAX, and so on and so forth available with this one. Um, it's not a performance efficient interface. So if you think you can shove a lot of uh, encrypted details in this and have high performance, while it can offload this to hardware, but you're paying the cost with the overhead of your system calls because it's a socket-based interface. So don't think you can have high performance with, uh, with hardware offload on that interface if you use it from user space. But um, since we don't have to do massive uh, operations, we do like maybe 10 or 20, this is actually really sufficient and avoids us having to import or audit or include any kind of cryptographic code because we can use just the kernel to do the work for us. And it will offload it and be happy and everything else. Um, the HMAX will guide a little more recent kernel, but I think everything around like 4.1, 4.2 will uh, work sufficiently. Um, if you have a Fedora box that updates the kernel, you have definitely everything you need right now. Um, there's a little bit of Wi-Fi specific crypto. Um, I, I don't know, honestly don't know why the Wi-Fi specification does some things they do. Uh, some of them has like 20,000 iterations of uh, hash that have to go over something crazy. So we have implemented these ones because they're really dedicated to Wi-Fi. They're currently implemented. Uh, inside IWD, but they're really limited, so it's not really much. Um, there's currently work ongoing for generic uh, uh, KDF stands for key derivation function, uh, KDF uh, subsystem for the crypto subsystem, so we'll be able to even do the KDFs inside the kernel by just specifying which KDF you want to do, and the kernel will do it for you. It's great if you have to chain certain things together, certain operations, you can say, oh, do this one, and then please generate, uh, derive the keys out of this one. Um, we don't know yet if this works for the Wi-Fi ones as well, we're looking into this ones. Currently, we don't think so, um, because the input parameters into these functions are not like uh, you have two keys coming in, one key coming out sort of type. You have like 20 different parameters coming in, and then the key comes out. So we have to see um, what's happening there. But I think it's a big progress. And these KDF is all uh, NIST-based, so it will avoid people trying to derive keys from existing keys and doing cryptographic mistakes. So um, that's a good thing for easy use. So after doing this one, um, we had this looking like this now. So as I said, the left side didn't change, but we needed a new interface that we're using. So Netlink h 11 into the kernel and AFALC into the kernel. We added support into L to actually do the uh, handling of AFALC correctly. There's a little bit funny stuff when you do ARC ciphers. Yes, ARC is still needed for certain crypto, like uh, WPA1 is still using ARC. Um, and then you actually really only have to, I want this cipher or I want this uh, HMAX supported and you basically get the return values back. And we abstracted this into L, so IWD doesn't really have to care. It calls the generic functions and all is good and we're all happy. So it's a little bit of extra code we had to put in there, but we felt it doesn't really blow this up uh, because AFARC is already there, it already existed. And we, bonus, we didn't have to include OpenSSL or GNU TLS or any cryptographic libraries or even run our own code and keep auditing it because the kernel code is pretty well audited. Um, so when we started actually doing the first WP2 encrypted connections, we actually ran into a couple of troubles that we had no idea how to use the interface. Why you think it's documented because it's a kernel API? It kind of is, but on the end it also it really isn't. And the way you have to put the keys in when you get uh, your four-way handshake done and so on and so forth is not really obvious. So we said, let's see what W Supplicant is doing there. And there's two ways of doing this one. Either we're gonna read the code uh, which in some cases actually will really fail because I still don't get my brain to understand what in some cases actually works in that spaghetti code. Um, or we're actually just going to sniff the interface. And there's actually a kernel driver that is called NLMON, which allows you to monitor any kind of Netlink traffic. So you can actually load this driver, create a monitoring interface, and then you can actually grab Netlink traffic and uh, decode it in user space. You need root privileges or net, uh, admin privileges, but then you actually can do this. So it hooks into Netlink and queues and du duplicates the SKBs that are queued on Netlink and puts them out into that interface as well, and you can just start reading them. So what we did, we wrote a new tool called IWMON uh, that can actually trace Netlink A211 and also no normal Netlink uh, like RTNL and so on. We also included an AF packet tracer so you can actually see all the AF pole frames. So you can see, okay, we finished the four-way handshake and that event is then coming at what time and so on and so forth. So for a simple thing, um, um, it looks pretty much similar to what we have for Bluezy. Uh, which BT Mon, uh, a little bit of color coding in there and a lot of decoding where it just uh, tracks the uh, request and the scan. So what you're seeing here is right now that you have uh, the crest, which is a trigger. So you trigger the scan. Um, the kernel then tells everybody else that the scan has been triggered, so it's a broadcast event. And then it also sends a dedicated response back to the caller uh, that uh, it succeeded. 
So you put in the SSID you're scanning for, test WPA, you also have the zero length SSID in there. The kernel then tells you back, yes, I'm executing a scan for these SSIDs, and by the way, I'm doing this on these frequencies. So I, I shut down the, uh, shortcut the list a little bit since it's uh, quite a long list. Um, and the, the response is just saying, yeah, that succeeded, I'm actually doing this for you. So the caller knows, oh yeah, the kernel's scanning for me now. Um, and what then happens is that the kernel will go, oh, I'm done scanning, and I have, e I have new results now. And it tells you, oh, I scanned on uh, this, uh, for this SSID, or these multiple SSIDs, and then these frequencies. And then you can go in the, go back to the kernel and say, can you just give me the results now? So as you trigger the scan, you get the information back that the scan completed, and then uh, you can actually dump your information. And with this one, you can easily see when, when WSuperCAN is scanning, what's happening. And you can do this for a lot of other cases. We're actually decoding all of the uh, Netlink or the uh, NLA211 uh, frames, um, not all uh, parameters, but pretty much almost all frames, and then you can see what's going on. Um, you will also see in a lot of cases you run this W supplicant that it has no idea what it's doing because it's hammering that interface and the only thing it gets, no such file or directory, which means you're trying to do something that actually doesn't exist or you're trying to create a station uh, that actually is not valid at the moment and you're trying to change things, uh, which scares you a little bit if you see a demon operating on something and just guessing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, it comes back from the wireless extension days where you actually had no idea what's going on and has been triggering through the config to interface where they're basically just pondering the interface and hoping at some point the kernel is ready and get the right information. So this tool by itself has been super powerful in just understanding what's going on with your network. It spits out a lot of information because these payloads are really large, but once you actually sit down and you can write them into PCAP files and just store them, um, once you actually go to it, you can actually debug a lot of things what goes wrong uh, when something actually really goes wrong. So at this point we had a wireless daemon we can connect to open access points, we can connect to WAP2 and WPA1, WAP2 access points. We had simple roaming working, so you can auto-connect and reconnect on this one. As I said, persistence was really important for us. And we had an experimental DBus MPI, and we had DBX support, we had tools for tracing, and we could do extra logging of DBus uh, and generic netlink uh, YL, and just enable this one on the fly. So this was really great. And we thought, that's kind of cool. Uh, and we would try, try thinking about releasing this one. Um, then out of a sudden this whole IoT movement come along and when you actually talk at IoT and actually try to build a wireless daemon that works on IoT devices, pre-shared keys and open networks are none of your concern most of the time. You're going to build something where you actually deal with certificates and enterprise level Wi-Fi where you actually want to uh, have devices really authenticate them so you can actually trust them and not some pre-shared key that you burn into your hardware. Because they are not helping you and you can't really publish them and they end up uh, being uh, published anyway. So we thought, okay, let's Let's take one step back again and fix also or figure out the Wi-Fi, uh, the enterprise Wi-Fi stuff, so we can do X five or seven, uh, X five or nine certificates. We can do TLS, um, and that one it went like, oh, we are back again at the question: Do we include new TLS or do we include OpenSSL or don't? As I said before, they're large libraries. I don't like them. I don't like the APIs. They're complex. They're hard to use, and they're still doing blocking operations when you do the handshakes for TLS which is something if you have a fully asynchronous single thread design, gets really in your way. You really don't want to do this because there could be events happening that you really want to react to and you don't want to waste your time in actually some TLS handshake. Um, so we needed a full EAP engine to start with and we needed a certificate support and we needed TLS. So TLS is actually not that hard. The EAP engine is a little bit harder. X509, X509 certificate handling is actually really complicated. So we took our third step back and said, okay, we need to figure out something different because we don't want to use OpenSSL or Glue TLS especially with the recent security flaws in these libraries. I wouldn't trust any of them anymore. So what we ended up is, let's look at the kernel keyring, which is one of the odd choices to look at when you actually consider doing TLS support. Um, but with, with recent advantages in a secure boot, the Linux kernel actually understands X509 certificates really well and understands quite a lot of it. And it has keyrings representing them. So you can actually have a chain of certificates loaded into your kernel and you can verify new certificates uh, against them which is like, look, that's pretty much what we need. So the only downside was the kernel only allows you to do it for built-in certificates of certificates that come from the hardware. It's like, look, what we actually need, we have a couple of certificates lying around somewhere. We need to load them. We have to create a CA out of them, so chain them together as a, as a CA. That's a, that's a key ring. The kernel has key rings. And then lock them and say, look, there's nothing else being allowed to modify them. I'm locking them down, and then we can have new certificates added to this one if they pass the checks and are verified by them. Um, either said than done, but I think the general idea was sound. 
So we started working on towards the case where you actually can maintain CAs inside the keyring, inside the kernel from user space. And while doing that one, we added sign, verify, encrypt, and decrypt as a operations to the key control interface. So you can actually use asymmetric ciphers uh, um, by when you have the certificates inside the kernel. So you can load the certificate, you can do operations on this one, uh, which means you don't have to implement RSA because the kernel is doing it for you. So this is still all work in progress. Um, Matt is actually maintaining a kernel tree that combines these subsystems together because one thing you find when you work on this one is that it's basically maintained in three different subsystems, or three different kernel trees, not three different subsystems, but the patches are spread around because one goes on a crypto subsystem, one goes on a keyring subsystem, one goes into another subsystem, and if you want to test this, um, you need to have a tree to actually get this uh, nicely pulled down and built from. Um, I think in a couple of months that tree will not be needed anymore, but right now it's the only way to do this until we have everything upstream. So history has the patches for user space sealable keyrings, so you can build your CA. The interesting part really with uh, the keyrings is that they actually can be inherited by any user process. You can fundamentally create your CA once as PID1, as systemd for example, and then you can just tell every new uh, process, here's the key ID for my keyring, and by the way, that's the CA. Uh, if you want to use it, that's fine, already sealed it, you can't do anything with it. But you can create a new keyring, you can clone it, you can reference it, and you can add extra certificates to it if you like. And you can do temporary ones and destroy them. So what we're trying to do is actually we're going to take take one of these master CAs, and then when we get a certificate from, um, from the remote site, maybe it includes CA and something else, we can actually put these in there, we chain them together, they get verified by the kernel, and then we know that the certificate is valid, and then we use that certificate with the key control sign and verify operations to actually make sure that this is a valid operation. And that way we can then have TLS minimally implemented by just implementing the TLS record protocol in user space and have all the CA handling and the, and the X509 handling moved into the kernel, and we don't have to drag an open SSL for this one. Our uh, long-term goal would be to put TLS also in the kernel. That's definitely something that will happen. Um, it's just a little more tricky since there's also enterprise side to think about this, where you actually open a socket that already has TLS support in there and how that can be done. Um, but getting the key ring side and the CA side sorted out is definitely one step to get this uh, closer. And the TLS inside the kernel is also wanted to be at the data centers where they want to don't want to offload this into user space. They want to have this actually offloaded in the kernel. And we have hardware, Intel Quick Assist, for example, it can offload RSA operations. So if you use this interface and you have a Quick Assist, in your, a Quick Assist card in your system, it will actually offload the RSA operation uh, onto actually hardware instead of just doing this in software. It's a nice benefit of doing this way because then you can actually have also hardware keys where you say your keys in the TPM and the TPM comes with an RSA implementation. You say like the keys in the TPM, I never see the key, or I don't want to see the key because I actually don't care just do the operation on it. So it puts it nicely together where we don't have to actually write a lot of user space code because the kernel's already doing this for us. So we did this and we also updated L. So it has base64 encoding and decoding because certificates come in different form or shapes like PM. So that one support me as well. Um, some, some of these ones are supported by the kernel but a little bit extra work you need in user space. It's not much so we felt kind of fine doing this one. Then you can have RSA keys so you can do RSA um, asymmetric cipher operations with this one, and you have keyring support where you can actually load your keys into the kernel. Um, and then we put TLS record protocol into L and have that one working as well. So we actually have a TSL support inside L without having to use OpenSSL or GNU TLS or any of the other variants, and without having to re-implement all the certificate handling and everything else. We just implement the TLS record protocol. So taking the diagram again, one extra piece we actually needed, the key control is a system call. Um, it's a multiplexer system call that allows you to do the various operations on key rings. Um, it's wrapped up behind L so we can actually use it. So IWD just uses L, L uses the key controls, and we have a full CA support inside uh, IWD that we have at our disposal for doing the enterprise stuff. So when we put this together, we have TLS support, we have TTLS support, and while this is not really enterprise, but uh, the WSC support for uh, WPS, the push button and pin stuff, has been also implemented as an EAP method. So there's a couple of more then we have to go through uh, step by step, but we now have the nice building box actually to build the Wi-Fi enterprise uh, support into IWD and it's already done and we already have this working uh, nicely. Um, obviously now it gets a lot more complicated and we actually want to test and verify this is all keeps working. So we went one step back again and said, look, we need something more. We also have, for all the protocols that we implement by ourselves, either in L or IWD, and there are real protocols, we can easily unit test them, we have unit tests for them. 
So WCS, uh, WSC is a good example. You can uh, unit test a lot of it. Um, some of the crypto stuff, it's a lot e easy to uh, uh, unit test them with sample um, certificates and so on and so forth. So when we do a mistake, there are bug caps and we find them really quickly. But we wanted to go one step further as well. So look, we need some automated testing where you actually can simulate an access point and more importantly, simulate a bad behaving access point. So what we have so far is we use uh, 811 uh, HWSIM, which is pretty much a virtual uh, Wi-Fi card um, that just combines virtual air together. So whatever packet you send there ends up on all the cards. So it's like a broadcast medium uh, with no latency and perfect uh, transmission. So it's uh, completely lossless, um, which doesn't help you. So you have to um, introduce some packet losses there, but it has a provision for there for doing so. We built a tool to actually manage this one, so you can actually do this from command line if you want to test with it. We don't really use it that much, but it was initially uh, good to do because the only other daemon using it was uh, W medium D, and that uh, was the only example of that interface. We built a test runner tool, uh, pretty much bought from Bluezy. It's a, it's a tool that can incept itself into a, running, uh, into a new kernel and keep your user space the same, and with that one we can actually have no Wi-Fi testing. And we currently use end-to-end -end testing with uh, host APD from W Supplicant um, because we haven't worked on the AP support for IWD yet. Once that happens, we are dog fooding ourselves and can even build more test cases where we have wrong behavior and wrong uh, uh, payload in four-way handshakes or EAP, et cetera. Um, and there's, as usual, a bunch of Python test scripts where you actually can ponder on the DBus interface to see what's going on. So uh, pretty well going. So what we have today, open Wi-Fi support, WP1, WP2, as I said, we left web out because we think it's completely irrelevant and should not be used at all. It's pretty much used in open Wi-Fi. And honestly, if someone wants to connect to an EAP, uh, sorry, an EAP, a web-based access point, we can crack the password on the fly if we really wanted to. There's really no difference between open uh, network and then web encrypted network. Uh, EAP TLS, TTLS is working. Wireless protected setup is working. Um, we have an EAP engine by ourselves with full EAP um, uh, over LAN support. We have persistent storage and we have a DBAS API. We have a tracing utility and we have a test framework. So all nice things that we can actually work. So there's a lot of improvements to do, um, but the next steps will be pretty much uh, getting us a DBus API that we like and say, okay, this is the API we want to move forward. And I give you a quick look on how this uh, actually going to look like. It's super simple right now because we really didn't need more since all the heavy lifting we're doing inside the daemon and conman or any other or network manager would be uh, pretty much enough for, yeah, uh, pretty much enough to write a simple plugin to actually get this going. I hope someone will actually do this. So you have to scan, you can disconnect, and you get a list of networks. It will audit for you by uh, metrics that uh, you find uh, documented, and it will give you the, the first one. The first object will be most likely the one you're actually looking for. Um, so it goes by RSSI and other signal strength information to find it. And then it just has a bunch of properties, uh, like the name, the address, and the state, uh, and so on and so forth. Pretty straightforward. It tells you state if it's scanning or not. If you want to do this one, so you know what's actually going on uh, on the hardware. The more interesting stuff is that our network hierarchy pretty much just has a connect method, so you can connect to that network and it tells you what name it is, and that's pretty much about it. Um, you also have an agent because with all our products, we actually need an agent when you actually have some user space entity to answer something for you, like what's your passphrase. We always push this into a functionality that can call this out in a third party. Uh, um, binary that allows you to do this. It worked pretty well with BlueZ, Nerd, uh, Ophone, and everything else projects. So we copied this one around as well. Um, and we have an interface that uh, gets you accessing the known networks. You can actually access the ones that you actually have been connected in the past and stored, even if it's not around anymore. So it allows you the uh, ability to remove them. So how this is going to look like if you would use it, if you start the daemon and you just do uh, one of the test scripts like list devices, it will actually just list you the physical device you have in there. It will list you the interfaces on these ones, and then it will list you the networks it found. Because once once IW starts and it finds a new network card, it will actually go background scanning for you as a, in a passive fashion. Um, so you actually can have these lists populated. Um, as you see, we even go fancy and go include the vendor and models of these ones. I just picked a, a Sony USB stick that I had around that has pretty much reliable if you want to USB testing. And it takes us from the hardware data database that system D ships or UDEF is shipping. And then it populates its information. So I did this about uh, an hour ago, or two hours ago. So you have the Linux Foundation Events Network here, signal strengths. You see the security. It's a PSK, so it's a WP2 encrypted network. Um, you see one funky SSID, and then you see the telecom has a uh, EAP, um, EAP SIM network with uh, 
one X, so that's talking here, but you have to open ones here from the hotel and the other one, the telecom hotspot. Um, there was nothing much there. I'm not even not shortcutting in this one, nicely fit on the slide, so it's kind of nice. That's pretty much when you start IWD and you uh, call this test script, actually will just show you this one. Um, what you can then do is just you can take this path. Um, these test scripts are really rudimentary for testing. The UI would all do this all for you, or Conman would just integrate this nicely. So you can literally just go connect to this network and you pick the one. I would have picked the Linux Foundation one since I know the passphrase for it. Um, and in case um, you would start as an agent on the other side, on another terminal or somewhere else, and then once it tries to connect and need the credentials, we actually, can you please input the credentials? You go like, here, that's my credential. It's pretty much on your badge, um, in case you didn't know this password. And then it will connect to it, it will succeed, and then at some point, um, or right away, it will show up in your known networks. And then you can just go list your network, and it will show up, oh yeah, this is the Linux Foundation, it's the last time I connected, the last time I saw this, and so on, of course. And that's all it does. It's not, IW is not supposed to give you an IP, but you could now run Conman Network Manager or whatever, and the DHCP test tool from Conman is actually doing exactly that one. So 20, uh, 20 is, is it 20 or 28? 20 is actually the interface index number um, because that tool only works on uh, interface indexes and not names, it doesn't do the name resolution. So that would be WLAN zero in this case, and then you can say, well, can you just get me the IP address? And you go like, sure, I try. And within a second, you get the IP address on the uh, Linux Foundation network, and you get the IP, uh, the name service, and so on and so forth. And so like, now I can program the IP address and then you can start using this one. So this would actually work, and I might gonna try this for just for the kicks of it. Haven't done a live demo in a while. I might just gonna try this live and see if this actually works if I describe this. Um, with this one, you can also then see the uh, uh, IW one. Um, sorry, you don't see this. Hold on. Mirror. Um, I think I need to increase this a little bit. Can someone tell me when this becomes readable? Is this big enough? Some nodes? Okay. Um, the switch, uh, no RTNL is quite important because if you actually want to listen to the RTNL, you get a lot of uh, uh, extra traffic from various applications that will just send you random stuff. Um, and you don't believe how many tools that you just execute just dump the list of network interfaces first. Yes, please. So you are demoing something that depends for you have a little Linux kernel, but this is not Linux, right? So what would it? Oh, sorry, isn't it obvious that I'm SSHing into a Linux machine? Okay. okay. <laughs> I thought that was obvious. Yeah, this is, otherwise that would be amazingly trick, right? <laughs> and you would like to know how I'm doing that. Actually, I've done that as well, you can do this. OS X has a hypervisor framework that allows you to do this as well, if you wanna be nifty, but then you don't get any hardware access. I, I hope this is visible now. So it's pretty much just gonna go start it, and it gets a little bit uh, chatting. But you also see then at the same time that this is what I talked about, where you're gonna trigger the scan, it will dump them. And then you get all these informations, and they're quite a lot. Um, but the nice thing is you can actually save these traces for offline processing, and then look at them, what actually happened when you see all this vendor-specific stuff, and it keeps uh, scanning and so on and so forth. So I, oops. If you do the list devices, you get one, what I found uh, earlier showed. Let's see. It's the same device in the end. Um, and you find your Linux Foundation network here that you have right there. And the monitor IWD tool that I'm running in the background here is pretty much everything that goes out on DBus broadcasted will actually let you know so you actually can see what we're sending out on DBus. Um, actually, another terminal. In case you wonder, I'm SSHing into VMware. And this would be then just um, registering the agent so I can actually enter the password. Connect network and then just give the object pass on this one. I said, once we have a comment plugin, that would do this all for you. And you see that the request comes up there. 
And at that point, then it goes, okay, I'm finally connected. And this is one of the magic ones where you have the station management where it goes from authorized now. Um, and at this point, you could just uh, And then DHCP will start it. Even this one is really fast, and I'm doing this live on the conference network. I didn't even bother take my access point out. And then you have an IP address on this one as well, and that would just work. And this is pretty much as simple as it gets. Um, and the code is built in a way that you actually have literally no dependencies. Um, so if you would actually do this uh, LDD on IWD, even L is statically linked into this one, so you literally have nothing. You don't need OpenSL, you don't need uh, GNU TLS, you don't need any NIPNL, you don't need anything else. It's all built in and optimized, and you can shrink this down as much as you want uh, and have this nicely uh, uh, built together. And you see the rekeying events, and it does the rekey offload, so on and so forth. And you see, you can really debug this now quite nicely. I think IWMON by itself is such a helpful tool if you have to do anything Wi-Fi and see what's going on. Uh, that alone will make a huge difference. So it actually works on a live network as well. So I'm not even trying to get my access point out and fake this. Okay. Back to the presentation. Separate display. If I find my cursor, there we go. So um, this is where we're at. There's a few things missing. And sadly, the slides already starts with the ones so that a few more things missing. So what we currently are missing is an IW control tool that we've built for like tools like Conman or Bluezy, where you actually have a control tool from user space or what system we carries around with other control tools that are easy to use. We have a skeleton for this one, um, but we don't have any code for this one yet. Um, we're trying to actually now start building that tool and use the Dbus API inside the tool so you have actually the first real user of this API besides the test scripts. The test scripts are nice, but at that point we haven't really gained anything once you actually build this all together. Um, our big one, uh, the Conman integration is missing. It's on our to-do list, and I already got a couple of offers from people trying so they will actually heavily, uh, happily work on this one and get this done and merge this upstream. So we're actually going to put comment support in there next. Our network manager, not planned from our side. Anybody happy to do it? It will be just not on our task list to do this. Um, but we're planning to do actually systemly network D integration so that systemly network D can utilize Wi-Fi networks as well besides our, uh, Ethernet and everything else. Um, we haven't really agreed on how we do the handshaking on this one and the interaction because as you see with some of the things, we have to deal with uh, link up, link down, and uh, transient links and uh, state changes of these things um, where system network D might actually have no idea what's going on and they need to be a little bit aware of what's happening. Um, especially since the interface will most likely stay the same, but if you connect to one access point, you might have to run DHCP. On the other SSID, you might have to run a static IP and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of extra work. Uh, the talks have been started on this one. We just haven't reached any conclusion yet. Um, the big thing on our list is getting proper roaming and access point steering working. Um, because these days with more and more 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz access points popping up, you need the, the band steering that is allowing you to actually pick the right band at the right time because otherwise you're either overloading your access point or you're scanning in wrong uh, areas and it will take forever to find a new access point. Um, Conman and WSuperCan has a little bit of support for it uh, thanks to the Nest guys working on this one, but we want to make this a first class policy that we have proper band steering uh, working on this one so we pick the right network and people have to stop putting 5 gigahertz on one SSID and 2.4 gigahertz on another SSID because that's really not helping. We need to be able to roam between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz operations if it's the same access point. Um, maybe not more and many people know that actually it's a separate radio and all these access points that support both frequencies. And if you take the newer ones, they're actually putting four or five radios in there to actually have more uh, capability for the high performance. But it will really only work if you allow band steering. Um, we want to offload certain features because some hardware can actually offload uh, passive scanning, background scanning, and some other key operations that you've seen. So we actually have to build a little more extra work to be able to offload these ones so we actually don't wake up. It's really important when you have power savings in mind and have some IoT devices that run Linux and you actually want to run, uh, run IWD. So you want to be off as, as long as possible. Um, the Dbus API is not stable yet. Um, we are heavily doing API review and the common plugin will be the first dog fooding. IW control will be the next dog fooding. So once we're happy with this one, how we can program it and use it, um, I think we're going to declare this stable. Um, fancy Wi-Fi features. Uh, Passpoint 2.0 is definitely on the list of things to look at, but um, especially with more access points coming up that actually support enterprise uh, Wi-Fi uh, authenticated with your SIM card, that's interesting. 
Uh, P2P I find interesting. I just don't know if it's the it's a big technology anymore. Um, we're trying to do this. I don't know if you get to Miracast doing it one, but we're definitely going to look into doing P2P and maybe someone finds it a nice use cases for doing P2P properly. Uh, neighborhood aware networking that's getting pushed into the kernel right now as a support feature. Frankly, I have no idea what to do with it at the moment, mainly because Bluetooth Low Energy does a way better job in doing this one, discovering devices and services and even specs for this one. So we have to see what the future of uh, neighbor, uh, neighborhood aware networking is and then see if we're actually going to take this in as well. Um, there's a couple of other features probably you have to do and feed something in there where you have to be a lot smarter than W Supplicant is right now, but we now have the framework to actually do so. Um, the source code is not yet available. We're heavily working on get this out of the company. I assume this will happen in the next couple of days or weeks, so it's really ready to go out and people have uh, toying with it one. Uh, the L code is public and the kernel crypto trees are available as well, so we managed to get these ones out already, um, but the RWD code uh, has to wait another couple of days. I hope by the end of the week or sometime next week we get this out the door. It's pretty much ready to go. Um, and with that, thank you and any questions? Yes, please. When you mentioned uh, the host APD ones, yeah. how is the access point support? It's not on our immediate radar, but we actually definitely want to do it. And you will need it for P2P anyway. If there are no further questions, then thanks, everybody, and have a good day.